Hey, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that all of history, all of time, all of creation, all of the Bible, even our own stories are about you. God, that you use imperfect vessels to reflect the beauty and perfection of your son, Jesus. So Lord, we pray today that you would deepen and enrich that journey that has either begun for some of us or is in process or maybe is about to start today, God, by uh, using your spirit right here and now to open our eyes to see what you want us to see, to open our ears to hear what you want us to hear, and most importantly, to open our hearts today that we would respond and become the disciples that Jesus wants us to be. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, I want to encourage you right here and right now to open up a Bible to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, you can download the YouVersion app, click on the More button. Um, actually, I didn't make a YouVersion live page, I'm sorry. So you can just go straight to the John one. I wanted you guys to flip a little bit today. Flip and click. It's not that hard. You can follow along today. Um, hey, I'm going to read this and we are going to dive right in. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I'm going to push pause right there. There is so much amazing theology in the first five verses of John. You know, the book of John is a unique masterpiece in Scripture that stands alone, even from the other four Gospels that were written, or other three Gospels, I'm sorry, that were written about Jesus. If you're newer to walking with God and Christianity, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels. They tell the story of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew starts out his gospel with a genealogy of the family tree of Jesus. I've preached about it in the past, and I titled it Jesus' Jacked Up Family Tree. Um, how many of you have a jacked up family tree and you're willing to admit it? I'm raising my hand high and proud right now. Um, and, and eventually he makes his way to the Christmas story and he emphasizes different aspects of it, including Matthew is the only gospel that records the story of the Magi. And so that was preserved for us that way. Um, Mark, on the other hand, he jumps straight to John the Baptist. He goes past Christmas and, and all that. And he goes right into John the Baptist. Um, interestingly, all four gospels talk about John the Baptist in the very earliest parts, emphasizing how important he really was in the biblical story. But Luke is that gospel where you get all those Christmas warm and fuzzies. All those verses that around the holidays you love to hear, they pretty much almost all come uh, from Luke. Um, and a little bit of a clarifier here, by the way, John the Baptist and John the Apostle who wrote the book of John are not the same person. Um, John the Baptist was beheaded during Jesus's lifetime. And to our knowledge, he never wrote anything, or at least he didn't write anything that was preserved uh, from history for us to know. Uh, John the Apostle and his gospel, which we are going to teach through verse by verse uh, for a good long while now, uh, he goes about things in an entirely different way. And one of the things that you'll start to notice as we study John over the next <laughs> period of time um, is that though the gospels all tell the same story, they emphasize vast different aspects of Jesus's life. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are really more alike than uh, John in that way, even though even in themselves there, there are a lot of differences. But John just stands alone. And one of the ways that we see the distinctiveness of John is where he chooses to start Christ's story. See, John doesn't start at Christmas. John starts at creation. And he goes way back and he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Um, and uh, so most scholars would agree that John was most likely the last of the four gospels written. We can't be 100% sure about that. Uh, but based on what we seem to know and understand, it's highly plausible that this book was written after the other three. Some have postulated that John considered himself a gap filler of sorts, that he knew the other gospels and uh, wanted to fill in the gaps in terms of telling Jesus' story. Others have suggested that he just told the story that he wanted to tell and the pieces that were important to him 
him and on his heart. I think there's probably a little bit of truth to both perspectives, um, but you're going to see throughout the story that uh, chronology is not as important uh, to John as themes. And so he's very interested in communicating certain key themes throughout the book. And without John's clarifications of certain key themes that are going to come up uh, throughout uh, the course of the next period of time, uh, later individuals throughout history might have easily propagated or further propagated the myth uh, that Jesus was just a man or that Jesus was a great, just a great teacher. Now, ultimately, and unfortunately, people still say those things even today, regardless. But John makes it clear that if you're going to believe that Jesus was just a man, or if you're going to believe that Jesus was just a great teacher, he made some cray cray statements in the Bible. Um, And and so you're going to see them in the gospel of John. And this is part, I believe, believe of why John starts Jesus's story at creation, he wanted to be clear right off the bat that this was no mere man. And interestingly, even that statement, the beginning of Jesus's story is somewhat uh, difficult to understand for us because Jesus had no beginning from an eternal sense. Um, See, he is eternal along with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, um, the, the first three words of John's gospel are in the beginning. All well, makes you wonder, the beginning of what? The world? Yeah. The beginning of Jesus's story? Yeah. But when did Jesus's story begin? It began in the beginning. <laughs> and, and you go, but when was that? When everything else started. <laughs> um, and, and it's a bit confusing to us in some respects as modern day 21st century readers, because we read a phrase like in the beginning, and we automatically assume that means Jesus had a beginning. But Jewish readers would have understood the reference that John was making. What John was doing was connecting Jesus's story to Genesis 1-1 in the very beginning beginning uh, that says this. Actually, leave a thumb in John and turn all the way in the beginning of the Bible to the book of Genesis. If you need help finding Genesis, raise your hand. We'll be right over. Um, In Genesis 1, 1, and 2, it says, in the beginning, help me out, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Um, And and so very interesting here uh, that we see the father there in creation in Genesis and who else do we see in the Genesis account present in creation? The spirit of God. Now John connects it back in John 1.1. 1, 1, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So right away, you see the Trinity in the Bible in the very first two verses of it uh, that says the Holy Spirit and the Father were there. John makes sure to connect that Jesus was there. So right off the bat of the gospel of John, he wastes absolutely no time connecting this Middle Eastern teacher that many had grown to love and, and know and serve John connects him to eternality and divinity right off the bat. Um, And Jewish readers who knew what he was trying to communicate would have immediately said blasphemy. Uh, You you can't equate Jesus with God. And later throughout the book of John, you will repetitively actually see uh, the religious establishment of Jesus' day say just those very words, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. John wanted to make sure that we all knew right from the beginning that Jesus was God. He was not created. He had no earthly beginning. Uh, I'm sorry, he had no uh, beginning in the divine sense. He had a beginning in the earthly journey uh, sense of it, uh, in the sense that he took on uh, flesh and he entered into time and space as we understand it. Um, Now, there's a fancy kind of theological Bible word for that, and it's called the hypostatic union, which means that Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He's got a divine nature and he's got a human nature that he took on flesh to uh, do these things I always say. I say to live the life we were meant to live, to suffer the punishment we deserve, uh, to die the death that we should have died and so he could rise from the grave so anyone who believed in him wouldn't perish but would have everlasting life. That's what he came to do. That's why he became a man. Um, and, and so it's really important that we understand that the, the, within the Trinity, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, when, when Jesus is in the Bible, it's not the Father shape-shifting as Jesus. They're distinct persons and yet they're one God. Uh, It sounds subtle, but it's an important difference that Scripture clearly affirms for us, and John makes sure that we understand as believers some 2,000 years later 
man, I am just getting started and we are barely into this thing. Personally, I love this kind of stuff. And, and so I want you to invite you right now uh, to open up your note sheet so I can have you write a couple of things down. We can participate in the message that way. Um, but the first thing that I want you to write down is the title of the message. And it's this, it's about him. Would you just say it out loud? It's about him. Um, Today we're starting a teaching series through the book of John, and I've subtitled it, uh, So That You May Believe, and that subtitle comes to us from John 20, 31, where he says, these things are written so that you may believe, and that by believing, that you may have life in his name. I believe that to be the theme verse of the entire book. Um, and, and so everything we're going to see in this gospel was written that you might believe in him, and by believing in him, you may have life in his name. John 1, 1 and 2 tells us that creation is actually about him, the word. And when I say him and that the word specifically, I'm talking about Jesus. That Jesus was intimately involved with the Father and the Spirit in creation. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him and without him was not anything that was made. Now again, hold a thumb in John and turn to the book of Jobs, I mean Job. If you need help finding Job, Find the big book in the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms. Take a left, and you'll find the book of Job. Job 12, and I'm going to read to you verses 7 through 10. Look what Job says about the story of creation. But ask the beasts, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. The bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. The fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And then check out this verse. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. I love what Job says. He says, the fish will tell you, the birds will tell you, the bushes will even tell you if you're not sure who's uh, the maker of all of these things. And I love in that verse 10 that it talks about how in his hand is the breath of all living things. Isn't that an amazing verse? I wonder when the last time was that you thought about the fact that we're all only one breath away from eternity. The Bible says that in his hand is the breath of all mankind. Now, again, leaving your thumb or your finger in the book of John, take a right to the book of Psalms, chapter 19, verse 1. In Psalm 19, 1, it's a beautiful verse about creation. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Uh, let me ask you a question. What was the last time, how, how many of you guys know, uh, ever looked up in the sky and just wondered and marveled at the creation of God? Have you guys ever done that before? It's amazing. Uh, now, where I live in my neighborhood, probably my guess is the same for you, I can see about three stars on a clear night. <laughs> but... If you ever just kind of get outside of LA, get into the desert or somewhere where there's not all this, like they call it light pollution or whatever, it's just an amazing thing to look up and say, wow. The Bible says that Jesus painted the stars so that it would tell us the story of our maker and our creator whom we all need. Um, and it's interesting, you know, sometimes I've heard people say over the years, well, okay, if, if all of history is about him, and, or if all creation is about him, and, and we need him in our lives, like what about people who never get the chance on this side of heaven uh, to, interact, or to, to hear the gospel? Well, actually, the Bible tells us the answer to that question. So again, leave a thumb in John, and this time uh, go over to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. This is what it says. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress by their unrighteousness, or who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Now, I'm veering a little bit off of John here, obviously, but Bible, the Bible tells us that creation itself is the missionary that points to the world's need for their creator. That you look up, you see the handiwork of God and the stars, you realize how small you are, and you realize how much you need him. It's about him. Um, creation is about him. Now, let me uh, just give one more little quick sidebar. There is a 
push in our culture today to remove male pronouns uh, when describing God. And I want to be absolutely clear that it is totally inconsistent with the biblical picture of God. The Bible uses male pronouns to describe God, and I think it's very important that if the Bible says something that we teach and believe it. Right, church? Um, Now, God has a certain order in his creation, and he expects us to conform to his order. And frankly, God doesn't really care whether or not we're comfortable with certain things in Scripture. God cares whether or not we conform to his view of who and how he says he is. Um, And our culture, what is happening is we are trying to conform a version of God in our own image instead of conforming ourselves, the creation, into the image of the creator who made us. That's what's happening in our culture today. Uh, We were created, fashioned, and formed in his image. And now, sure, uh, sin has marred things considerably, but we are still called to submit ourselves to God's created order. He's God. We are not. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Um, And John 1, 1 and 2 tells us creation was one of his, that being Jesus's greatest masterpieces that points us to our need for for, for Jesus. Uh, History is about him. You know, even that phrase, in the beginning, shows us how actually Christ invented even the very concept of time and space as we experience it and understand it. We live in a temporal world. God does not. He operates in and through time as a construct made for us uh, because we experience it, but God is actually outside of time and space in that way. And history, the timeline, is actually just his story. That's what it is, quite literally. Um, Now, some people push back at this kind of thinking and say, okay, well, if, if history is really just his story, then, then Kyle, how do you explain all the nasty and awful things that have been done throughout uh, all history? Like, why would God allow that stuff? Well, and to that I would say, you're absolutely right. There have been some horrible things that have been done throughout human history, even just in my brief lifetime. Um, and there will be lots more uh, that we haven't even heard of yet that are going to unfold in the future. And I would say the answer, as much as I can think of it, is that, that we live in a fallen world. And that's why Christ stepped into the world uh, to be the light uh, in this dark space, to redeem time and space that he created to be a certain way that sin marred. Jesus came to redeem it. That's what he that's what he meant to do. That's the whole purpose of history. So creation's about him. History's about him. Even all of the Bible is actually about him, him again being Jesus. Um, Jesus is called the word in John chapter one. Now, why is that? Um, the Greek word that's used there is actually the word logos and just means word. But Jesus is actually the embodiment of the whole of the Bible, the written word of God. And, and I'm gonna like Bible nerd out for like five minutes here if I haven't already been doing it enough. Um, Um, There is a group out there uh, known and referred to as the Jehovah's Witnesses. How many of you are familiar with them or know of it in some way? Um, And I want to just talk about this for just a a moment because it's related to John 1.1 and how they understand it. Um, Well, I want to be clear at the top that I would place them well outside of Christian orthodoxy and well into the camp of heresy. And I'm very careful uh, with how I use that word even. But the reason for that is that they deny the divinity of Christ, among other things. And if you ever meet them at your door, they're quite knowledgeable with the Bible. How many of you, raise your hand if you know what I mean. I'll put in quotes though. Their Bible, (laughs) their understanding of the Word of God. See, the reason I say their Bible is that they twist the Bible and add things in there that aren't in there, uh, confusing and frustrating many well-meaning Christians into their predetermined uh, thought process that Jesus isn't God. And one of the things in particular that they add in, quote again, their Bible, is a twisted translation of John uh, 1, 1 and 2, and specifically the way that they do this is it says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and or the word was with God and the word was God John 1 1 that's that last part the word was God now right before the word God is the Greek uh, article it's ha which is like a little o with an apostrophe on it that means the and so you can also translate John 1 1 that the word was the God or the one and only God Um, so the way that they 
twist this is they say that in the Greek, uh, that it was actually ha is a relative article like a. So they say that Jesus was a God, not the one and only God. But anyone who knows and understands biblical Greek understands that it's clearly, it could be the God, the one and only God, God alone, but definitely cannot be translated a God. And so these folks use this little trick on people who don't know Greek to deceive well-meaning but uninformed Christians into doubting Orthodox Christianity. And I want to clear this up for you once and for all. First things first, in Greek, there is no capitalization. Um, And so the manuscripts are all in capital letters. The way that you figure out capitals and all that kind of stuff is through context and understanding pronouns like that. Uh, But anytime the word God is used, it is capitalized if there's a definite article in front of it, which in John 1, 1, there definitely is a definite article in front of it. So Jesus is the word, the one and only true God, the God. John 1, 1 makes us absolutely clear that all of the Bible is about him. Uh, All of history is about him. All of creation is about him. And you know what else is about him? Our own stories. And you know what? Sometimes what we want to do, we want to make our stories a little bit more about us. And a little bit less about him. You know, when something good happens in our lives or we do something right, we want to make that about what we did. Unless we do something wrong in our lives, then we want to make it about what somebody else did, right? Which is actually just another way of making our own stories about us. But God says, even our stories aren't our stories. That if we understand John 1 as Christians, if we understand our stories properly as Christians in light of that, that our story is actually his story. Um, and, and, you know, the truth is uh, that includes victories and our failures. Um, and, and so some of you can say, might say, well, what do you mean? How could my failures be a part of God's plan? Well, what I mean is it wasn't God's desire that we fail, but God would take our failures and use them in spite of it for his glory. Um, and I mean that even in failures and setbacks that we will grow and learn more if we learn to ask the question, what does God want to do in me and through me as a result of this situation rather than whose fault is it? Or maybe on the positive side, rather than which amazing human is responsible for this thing? Even that sounds nice, like, oh, wow, they did so great. But even the, the bad things and the good things in our lives aren't really even our stories. They're his story. And, and he gets the glory and the credit for it. Now, I also believe Self-reflection is a really good thing. It's, it's good to look back and say, you know, I, I should have done this differently. I should have done that better. That's really important for every person. Uh, but it's also important that we don't get wrapped up in ourselves in it, that we learn to view our own stories through a redemptive lens in the way that Jesus looks at us. Now, I might not like certain things about myself, but God created me in the way that I am to reflect him. Uh, John 4 says, one four says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. In our culture today, uh, we are always looking to other things to be the light and life of men other than God. And I think there are two particular ways where I see this most prominently in our culture today. In our culture, the two false gods that I believe that we are per- per- perpetually tempted to bow to are, are this. Here's the first one. Uh, I think we're perpetually tempted to bow to the God of sexual fulfillment. And, and the idea that I mean by that is in our culture is that if a person isn't sexually fulfilled in their life, that somehow something is wrong with them. Uh, now, listen, in the context of a marriage between a man and a woman, sexual fulfillment is a great thing, but it is also a fleeting thing uh, that, that, that's un- undeniable. Um, and the second God that I think we're perpetually tempted uh, to bow to in our culture today is the God of potential. And the idea is that if a person isn't living up to their human potential uh, in some way, that God is disappointed with them or that they're not really living or experiencing everything God wants for them. Well, really, those things in and of themselves aren't bad things in the right con context, uh, but the Bible doesn't actually place those two things as really that important in life 
Really, the, here's what the Bible says is important in life. The Bible says worship and obedience are the most important values for every Christian. And, and right there in John 1, 4, it says that if I want to live my life's deepest meaning, my life's deepest fulfillment, and my life's deepest purpose, I need to find it in him and in him alone. And anytime I start looking for anything other than him to be the light and life of my soul, I am going to come up empty Every time. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. In him still is life, and that life still is the light of men. I want to suggest something to you today. If you're dissatisfied with your life today, maybe it's because there's not enough of him in it. Because God says in him is life. And that life is the light of men. You can try to buy everything in the world, have every sexual fulfillment relationship, whatever it is you want to do. You can try to hoard things. You can go and have experiences and travels. But if you're trying to fill this void on the inside with that, you're never going to find life. In him is life. And that life is the light of men. How many of you love life? I love life. Now, sometimes we don't like it so much, right? (laughs) And we go, man, heaven's going to be nice. (laughs) And and kind of joking aside, you know, all of us have either personally or uh, known someone who has struggled with the desire to take their own life, or maybe even some of us in here have been there and and themselves where you thought, man, I just, I just can't keep doing this thing called human existence anymore. Um, and, and, and so being very serious now, suicide is a very horrible thing, but I also believe that it is a sin just like any other sin that God can forgive. And you can step uh, from that decision into the arms of Jesus right away. But here's what I believe when someone is either contemplating that choice or actually makes that choice and they are despairing of life itself, Self, here's what I think. They're not looking at Jesus. They're looking at their own pain that they're feeling on the inside. And if they are, even in their own way in that moment, looking at Jesus, they're still looking at him through the distorted filter and lens of themselves and their own uh, pain because Jesus is the source of life. And in that moment, they just can't see it. Um, But what I'm here to suggest to you today is that the more we connect our stories, no matter how tough they may be at the time, to his story, the more life we find in him. And and I want to just be very clear. If you're struggling with that very thing or know someone who is, go to a Christian person today who can help you find the help that you need in Jesus' name. If you are struggling with that, I want you to know that it is okay to not be okay. And I also want you to know that it is not okay to not be okay and not reach out for help. God put the church here. God put people around you to help you in times like this. It's also not okay to not, or to to stay not okay when there's resources and people who would love to help you and support you. Um, So find the help that you need. The Bible seven times here in the first five verses of the book of John alone says uh, that there is life in him. Um, And then in verse five, there's this introduction of the concept of darkness. And and this idea that shortly after creation entered the world, darkness did too. I'm going to reread verse five. It says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Um, You see, the the darkness has never and will never overcome the light of Christ. Uh, Tell your neighbor one more time, it's about him. Whatever you're going through in your life right now, it's not about you. It's about him. The Bible's about him. History's about him. All of creation is about him. Your story is about him. So if that's true, uh, the next thing in the note sheet just talks about my role in his story. And I want you to write down the first thing. The first part of our role in his story is to receive the light. Now, for starters, that happens at salvation. And for uh, Some of you in here, that was a more recent decision. Uh, Maybe for some of you in here, that hasn't happened yet. For some of you in here, it was a little more distant past. For some of you, it might have been years and years and years ago. Uh, But 
in our society today, there are countless voices out there that argue that if we just reallocate certain resources or restructure society somehow, that we'll build the kind of world where charity and equity will win the day. Um, there are other voices that would argue that issues of hopelessness are more personal and that human souls are in need of repair and renewal. And if we just provide everybody with the right education and therapy, then maybe everything else in their life will be made wrong. And don't get me wrong, uh, I'm a believer in those things. They're needed, they're useful, and they're helpful in the right context, and they're very positive. I believe in the power of all of them on a human level. But the thing is, John shows us that we don't need a message that offers hope. We need the message that is the only hope, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And listen, if every child and adult got access to the best counselors, the best education, the best therapy and healthcare known to man, that would be a wonderful thing. I think all of us would agree with that. But if all that happened and those people also didn't receive the light of Jesus for salvation, they would quickly realize that all those things are just things. And eventually, they're still gonna be without hope. Um, and if we're gonna be if we want to find lasting hope, there's only one person in whom it is found is the light of Christ. John 4, 1, 4 says, in him was life, and that life is the light of men. Politics are not the light of the world. Technological advancement is not the light of the world. Lower gas prices are not the light of the world, though y'all be stoked on it, right? Amazon Prime delivery to your front door is not the light of the world, <laughs> In fact, in some way, it can just further all these addictions we have to try to fill our need of things with buying more stuff and getting it right away without even having to go anywhere. He is the light of the world. John makes it explicit that those who reject the light which enlightens everyone are walking in spiritual darkness. And you know, in church, I never ever want to assume that everyone in here has made that decision already in their life. And if you haven't done it yet, I'm gonna give you a chance at the end of the message to settle it once and for all. So we receive the light of Christ at salvation. Uh, but I think it's also important that those of us who have already made that decision uh, remind ourselves to receive that light just a little bit every single day. And for, um, I, I still think it's important that we reprioritize it. It can really, things in life can just take precedence really quickly if we don't do that and if we're not intentional about it. Here's the next part of my role in his story. Uh, the next thing is to repent of my personal darkness. Some of you in here today have received the light of Christ for salvation of your soul, but you're still walking in in darkness uh, spiritually because there is unmistakable sin that you need to repent of. Now, repentance is this idea of turning away uh, from old thought patterns and, and behaviors and things like that and running towards the new habits of the new way of the light of Christ. I also believe that it's a process and it's a journey. And there are things that uh, you start to think about and slowly begin to make steps in your life towards a, a better direction. Uh, but when we bring darkness into the light, it just melts away. How many of you remember that scene from The Wizard of Oz where the, the wicked witch just melts? You know the one I'm talking about? I went back this week on YouTube, and uh, if we had, didn't have like issues with copyright and showing things online with stream and weird complications that now we have that we didn't used to have, if we didn't have all that, I was going to show it in there, but I went back and I, I learned that was from 1939, that movie. Isn't that amazing? Like, it still looks good. It sounds good. Like, the special effects of that witch, like, going into the floor were just phenomenal. I don't know how they did that. But anyway, you know, the scarecrow catches on fire, and, and Dorothy gets that little bucket of water, and she sprays it on him to, to put it out. And she gets touched with the water, and she goes, I'm melting! Such a good scene. And when I was putting this message together... I thought, man, that's exactly the picture of what happens when sin is brought into the light. It just gets squelched and melts away. Some of you might ask, well, 
Okay, how do we bring sin into the light? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you. First off, it starts with confessing it to God. That's the very beginning and the quietness of your heart. Um, a lot of Christians go there, but they don't take it to the next part. The next part is confessing it to another believer. And, and that's a really important piece where this isn't just something that you're dealing with when you and God. You're inviting another person along into your journey. And, and the third piece of it, which if if it's safe to do it, is, is really where the, the things really get brought into the light, is to confess it to the person that you actually harmed uh, or hurt. Now, in some cases, it's not safe to do that. But when it's safe to do that, uh, it can be a very powerful and healing thing. Um, sometimes we're terrified to confess things because we're afraid of the consequences of what will happen if we do it. But let me put it to you this way. Um, If you don't confess something, the consequences negatively for your life will actually be greater. Here's what I mean by that. The consequences of concealment are immediate. I'm sorry, the consequences of confession are immediate. They usually affect a handful of people, one, two, three, four, five, maybe 10 um, in most cases, and then it's over and it's done. And it might be painful and difficult, but you can begin to take the steps towards uh, healing and restoration. Now, the consequences of concealment, on the other hand, they affect a lifetime. They affect every future relationship that you come into contact knowingly sometimes and unknowingly. And they also affect the next time you screw up as a Christian, you're going to be that much more tempted to conceal it and keep it in the darkness. You know, darkness festers and grows in more darkness. That's how it grows. But when the light of Christ is shined onto something, it's brought out into the light, it just uh, has a way of melting it away. Um, and, And soon enough, that thing that we were so worried was going to destroy our lives becomes a story of hope of how Jesus transformed us from the inside out that can help somebody else. And once the light of Christ enters into our hearts, we need to confess it to God. We need to confess it to other people. And what we're afraid will happen well, when we confess it is that our life is going to be ruined. But I love what Acts 3.19 says about that. Um, this guy is preaching here in Acts 3.19, and he's encouraging people to repent. And in Acts 3.19 and 20, he says... Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And here's the the part, if you're an underliner, highlighter of your Bible, it says that times of, help me out, refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. And, you know, sometimes we think, man, if I'm going to confess this, everything's going to end. It's going to be so hard. And God says, no, that's going to begin the journey of him refreshing your soul from the inside out in a true and healing way, which takes me to the next part of our role in his story is to be refreshed by the light. And when we don't make the conscientious choice to be refreshed by the light daily, we allow the darkness to prevail all over again. Um, I think it's so helpful that we just, even if it's just a few moments in your life, you just take a few moments of the day to be refreshed by the light uh, of of the things, maybe read some Bible verse, a devotional. Um, It's just a powerful thing that God gives us to renew our souls from the inside out. And now go back to John. I'm going to read you verses uh, six, six through eight of chapter one. And we see here the entrance of John the Baptist into the gospel of John. John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He was a witness. To be- he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And I'll push pause right there. Now, uh, as you get to know John the Baptist's story, he took all of the success that he experienced in ministry and he just gave it away to reflect and point everybody else towards Jesus. John the Baptist's whole life was to be a reflector of the light of Christ. And I believe that ultimately all All of our roles as Christians is to be little John the Baptists who simply reflect the light and the life that Christ has given to us. And this takes me to the fourth uh, part of our role in his story, to reflect the light of Christ. Uh, Man, the minute somebody steps over the line and becomes a Christian, I think there just becomes this almost intrinsic and immediate awareness that my life isn't about me. Uh, My life isn't about just the things that God wants to do in my little family, that I'm here to bless other people. I'm here to model Jesus's love in a way that draws them in. See, it's about him. I, my part in it, though, is I receive the light. I repent of my darkness. I get refreshed by that light, and I reflect it to other people every single day. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for 
using imperfect vessels to reflect the beauty of your son, Jesus. May we do it more effectively. May we do it more consistently. And may we do it genuinely from our hearts, from a place of love for your people. And right now, I want to specifically pray for anybody in here who's actually despairing of life itself. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would encourage God that you would cause uh, anyone who might be thinking about that or, or has or know somebody who has uh, to be refreshed in your presence right now. God, help them to reach out for help. Help them to know they're not alone, that you love them. God, I pray for anyone in here who needs to repent of some darkness. And the Lord's been tugging on your heart for a, a long time about a particular part of your life. Nobody in here knows, but between you and God right now, you know. Father, I pray that they would take that step to confess it to you right now. At some point today after church, take the step to confess it to another believer so that they could begin to experience the times of refreshing that want to come, that you want to bring from your presence, God, in all of our lives. And if you're here and you've never received the light of Christ, I'm going to give you a chance right now to settle it once and for all. God says he'll forgive you of all your sins. He'll adopt you into his family. He'll fill you with his spirit. He'll give you an eternal life. It's beyond anything that you could ask for or imagine. There's only one catch. Jesus wants the steering wheel of your heart. And so if that's you and you've been running from God, window shopping the Bible and the claims of Christianity, uh, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Adopt me into your family. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, I am tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Take over. In Jesus' name I pray.